and today's convener, Mr. Rindan Kundu, distinguished delegates, participants, and dear students, Jai Gurudev and Namaskar to all of you. It is indeed a privilege to speak at the inauguration of the national webinar on wall literature hosted by Swiss University. While this webinar will focus on the concepts of national comparative and world literature, it will also cover the transmission of texts and the consumption and production of literary texts, epistemologies and philosophies across spatio-temporal dimensions and national delimitations within the context of an international setting. Every society is dependent on language as a mode of communication of its morals and traditions. As human beings, the linguistic abilities which set us apart are closely related to our ethnic backgrounds, culture and traditions. Language way of passing down the stories of our rich heritage, mythology, history and legacy to future generation. This constitutes literature. For a student, irrespective of their field, the importance of language or literature is paramount. It is a way in which they learn to communicate and express themselves. And more importantly, it is a way for them to understand life. Thus, literature is the foundation of life with a multitude of topics ranging from pathos, philosophy, celebration, and love. While it is physically written in words, the creative expression of renowned poets, authors, and dramatists brings these writings alive. The idea of India is holistic and dynamic. We are a product of a thinking race, which puts value system ahead of temporal matters. Renowned poets and laureates such as Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore, Srimati Sarojini Naidu, Srimati Munsi Premchan, and many authors in Odisha, Kavi Samrat Upendra Vanja, Kavi Shurya Baldevrat, have contributed to the vast repository of literature of our land. In the modern era of post-truth, it is essential that an individual's written and spoken communication are structured in a coherent manner. The very purpose of, its, of this webinar is to listen to varied perspectives, exchange ideas, and disseminate information. There are no barriers to learning language and literature. The basic of all literature is the same, irrespective of region, nationality, and language. As an artist, every movement I, every movement and aesthetic expression constitutes literature. Whenever I conceptualize a movement, I create a language within me and the bodies of the dancers, which takes the form of the movement over a presented to an audience. Whether it is the field of business, science, technology, or arts, literature enables people to see the world through the lenses of others. It gives us the ability to form human relationships and define what is right and what is wrong, making it indispensable to us, apart from enabling us to establish our self-identity it instills a purpose and conviction in life. It connects us intellectually and cognitively to people from different walks of life. In the field of education, literature is a reflection of the past and the mirror of the society in present times. Thus, literature enhances our connection with our history, forms the basis of our creative expression in the present and gives us hope and vision for the future. Before I end, I would like to congratulate Mr. Rindan Kundu and the Department of English and Foreign Languages for organizing this milestone event and giving me this wonderful opportunity to share my views with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind words. I'll now request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to kindly say a few words on the occasion of the inauguration of the webinar. Good evening, Jai Gurudev. Namaste to all of you. It's a pleasure to be part of this event, which is first of its kind. And 
mainly because of the initiative taken by Dr. Rindan Kundu. So my heartiest congratulations to you, the leadership of the department, Professor Kalyani Samantraji, who is heading the department, and the dean, Professor Ratikant Mahapatraji, of Faculty of Arts, Communication, and Index Studies, and the entire team of the faculty. My heartiest congratulations to all of you. Our Honorable President, Madam Srimati Raita Kulkarni ji, the main speaker of today, uh, Dr. Sachin C. and Dr. Satyan, Satyan Das Gupta ji, who will be talking today about world literature, comparative literature, and academic social responsibility today. Dear delegates, participants, guests, and friends, once again, good evening to all of you. I was just you know, thinking about what academic social responsibility should mean. I was reminded of my association with the social responsibility standard, which has been made by ISO. 26,000 is the number for that. And we were party to that. Our professor, Shiram Khanna from Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi was nominated member from India in that particular committee which was drafting this ISO 26000. So we were also party to some of the workshops in that. So that was like any organization, like corporate social responsibility in India is about, you know, corporate role of corporate towards social responsibility. This ISO 26000, which was made public on November 1, 2010. Uh, this talks about any kind of organization, which includes our academic organizations as well, NGOs and all others. So I was just you know, thinking about what kind of commonalities could be made out of this. Uh, you are the best judge in terms of uh, the you know, comparative literature and its journey towards world literature and all that. So I'm not an authority on any one of these things. So I was just thinking how this academic social responsibility can be you know, brought on the fore. Like UGC has guidelines on plagiarism and if it is you know, commonality or similarity index is less than 10%, then you allow a PhD thesis to be submitted and all that. That is one aspect of this that is part of your responsibility as an academic, that you must make sure that intellectual property rights and all those things are maintained, copyrights, patents, trademarks, and all those things are respected. That is one side of the story. The other side of the story is what an academic institution should you know, commit to the society. What is the vision of an academic institution? Like Gurudev yesterday was talking to someone in, in the evening program and he was saying, what is the role of media? The role of media is to give a narrative to the people which can give direction to the society. So similarly, academic institutions are also meant to give direction to the society. It is supposed to develop, build character of people in the institutions. The next generation which will lead the world is going to be nurtured in academic institutions. So what kind of uh, social responsibility aspects we are building in them is something which is very important for academic institutions. And literature, as Professor uh, Ratikan Mahapatraji mentioned, that it is the language which actually is a medium of communication amongst people. There's an organization which says that the world exists in terms of language. Whatever we think is the world, actually it is described by the words, by the expression that we give. And Professor Atikan Mahapatra is an expert without saying words also he can express through different you know, mudras and all those things that he was talking about. So that is another you know, aspect of that. But uh, for this particular conference, uh, the language is going to be the main part, which is in terms of verbal language. So how much of it is uh, you know, leading to what kind of world? Are we making a better world of tomorrow? by our contributions in the academic world, in terms of our writings, in terms of our you know, interaction with the students in the classroom, in terms of our interaction in these kind of webinars. So what kind of mindset we are you know, developing amongst ourselves as teachers and to the next generation who are our learners, our students in the classrooms, or who are you know, attending some kind of FTPs and MTPs and things like that. So Disha Jisko Kethan, the direction which has to be given by the academic community will decide the future of the world in the times to come. So with these few words, I would again wish and congratulate uh, for the grand success of this webinar series, which has been initiated by the department and the faculty. 
and uh, i i congratulate once again to all of you thank you very much for inviting me thank you so much sir your words were really inspiring now i will request honorable president madam to kindly address the august gathering and inspire with her words uh dr rindan thank you very much uh, before i start i want to just point out two things uh, you know i am noticing the participant count is getting stuck at 500 so it is possible there is a challenge with the zoom link you need to tell the back end team it had happened once before also i think they need to unlock something because i know you have uh, many more uh, participants than this because it's reaching 500 and dropping so that's one and secondly i'm seeing a lot of chats where people are saying um, cannot hear so uh, i'm i'm able to hear but there some people seem to have that challenge so maybe you want to just address that with the back end team so thank you again uh, uh, dr rindan and um, good evening to everybody uh, good evening dr singh uh, vice chancellor of shishi university uh, good evening uh, uh, dr ratikan mahapatra ji dean of the faculty Uh, facis as we call it and uh, good evening dr kalyani samantrai uh, head of department um, of um, english languages i mean our languages and um, head of the department and uh, rindan congratulations to you i'm very impressed and very <coughs> um, um uh, just give me a moment i have something in my <coughs> sorry and uh, i'm very impressed and actually overjoyed that uh, in shishi university we are convening this kind of a national webinar a week long event um to really uh, celebrate literature and uh, i feel that in at a time of life in the world where uh, reading capability has unfortunately got restricted to um, uh, the the twitter length or the hashtags on instagram uh, to see that so many people have registered for the appreciation of literature to dive deep into what it means to us in our life and uh, like you said dr singh what kind of mindset it is creating for us i think it's a fantastic and a very very positive sign it's a very i'm very happy actually i to be honest i didn't expect these many uh, participants to be there so i congratulate you for reaching out i know there are people from all over the world who are uh, joining us today and all age groups all nationalities across all cultures so i virtually welcome you to shrishi university i think in a way this lockdown has ensured that uh, we could uh, you know come together in such large numbers as well so virtually welcome to shrishi university uh, you know um, today we are talking about literature and um, again i'm not an expert in literature i am more a consumer of it or i am more more someone who has been uh, you know who has been impressed upon by it or who has been sculpted by literature um, one of uh, one of uh, my favorite uh, authors uh, who who didn't write serious things but in that brought out a lot of serious insights about life was pg woodhouse in fact at home i have the entire collection of pg woodhouse and he famously has said that there is no surer foundation for a beautiful friendship than a mutual taste in literature and i think uh, today is kicking off this kind of a uh, i think uh, this initiative for building lifelong relationships because uh, celebrating literature you know one of our main uh, buildings in shrishi university what you can see behind me in my virtual backdrop is called shruti and shruti or by listening is how uh you know really if you uh, look at the genesis of literature sanskrit literature whether it was ramayan by mahabharat all of it began by oral transmission by shruti somebody said somebody heard and it got trans you know it got transmitted translated uh, transcribed and that is how in fact even if you think of bhagavad gita the bhagavad gita is has come to us because lord krishna spoke about it to arjun and that got transcribed it got downloaded and that is what has come down to us uh, for uh, you know centuries and thousands of years now it has got preserved 
so literature is life you know uh, uh, dr ratikan mahapatra you spoke so eloquently in fact i would like to have a copy of your speech it every word was like a pearl literature is is that pearl of our life it is that which i think upholds the dignity it upholds the regality it upholds the integrity of what we understand as life um, you know as a consume consumer of literature or as i said someone who has been sculpted by it i used to be a voracious lead, reader in my childhood in my younger days and um, you know for me uh, literature did a few things you know in a world at that time which was not so flat which was not so interconnected which was not so easily travelable i think uh, uh, the books that i read gave me a peek into the into the world that i could not visit i think it is it was such a powerful uh, imagery that without visiting a place without being in a place without having met some people it allowed me to create an impression of it in my mind and i think that is the biggest gift literature gave me that it allowed me to visit places and meet people without physically having to do so and i think it does that for everybody because it you know in reading the story you not only read the words or in reading uh, you know in reading the paragraph you don't not only read the words but you you create with your own with your own mind your own impressions and uh, i think that's very very powerful i it allowed me to really expand my horizons because it allowed me to travel it allowed me to travel across uh, time zones it allowed me to travel across borders i think it really expanded my my mind it really exploded my mind and i think it even developed somewhere a, a very good critical thinking capability uh, in me i think when you read you learn to make patterns i think when you read you learn to read between the lines when you read you learn to look beyond the words and i think that develops the critical thinking capability in you and i think it it has lasted me my whole life you know it has lasted me up till now i think it will last me forever and uh, more than all of this i think it allowed me to appreciate humanity as one you know our founder pooja gurudev shri shri ravi shankar ji always speaks about the maxim of vasudeva kutumbakam the world we are one family and how do you experience this family at home we meet family we talk to them we fight with them you know uh, we have a meal with them so you experience that unit as a family but how do you experience the world as a family for me the first introduction to this concept was through the books i read and um, i i mean you know i, I saw uh, places before i visited them i experienced cultures cultures before i you know uh, dived deep into them so th that was very precious and uh, lastly i think it somewhere allowed you know even today uh, when i read uh, some of the old old literary texts you know i come from maharashtra which has a huge lineage of uh, really really you know very very um, uh, amazing uh, literary works authors uh, poets and uh, from very childhood we were uh, sort of uh, encouraged to uh, to embrace and uh, spend time in reading and you know learning them and uh, to i think it gave gave me a peek into the past and through their words some sort of a idea of the future even today there are many many great authors and thought leaders who write about what is to come in the future well nobody really knows but to even be able to connect the dots you know make those patterns think of what might lie ahead i think it's a big service to mankind to be able to write such things and for us it's a big gift to be able to read this so i am really delighted dr kalyani that so many again rindan we are stuck at 500 participants so you have to tell the tech team to make sure that they release it so that all those who are still waiting to enter the webinar uh, will be able to do so so dr kalyani i want to congratulate you that you have uh, you know conceptualized and curated this event uh, today's uh, speaker professor sayantan dasgupta uh, dr dasgupta i hope you remember last year we met at the university of hyderabad where we were talking on university social responsibility uh, you were presenting a paper there uh, and i was also speaking and um, uh, it, it was great to meet you then and i'm delighted that you have uh, 
you are participating in our webinar at Trishi University today uh, and presenting your paper. And all the other speakers this week, Dr. Bardali Chanda, Dr. Mrinmay Parmanik, Professor Sachin Ketkar, uh, Professor Indrani Lacharya, and Dr. Kiran uh, Keshav Murthy, all of you, uh, I want to thank you for taking your time. And I'm sure that all the uh, thoughts you will share will be exceptional for our students and all participants of this uh, week-long conclave to learn and uh, to hear and learn from. Uh, this is the time of, uh, you know, it is an unprecedented time in, uh, in the, in, uh, for the world, for all of us as a humanity. I think uh, we have not experienced it before. And at a time like this, when emotions, when uh, mental states can go through very, very tough ups and downs, to take time out, to appreciate and dive deep into the finer aspects of life, which really nourish our mind, which really nourish our intellect, which really challenge us to think beyond our, you know, think beyond our normal thoughts. I think it's a fantastic initiative. I'm going to try Dr. Kalyani if I can attend every day um, for some time to listen to all the great speakers that uh, you have invited. And uh, I really wish you all the very best for this week. Um, I, I believe that only the weak-minded refuse to be influenced by literature or poetry. So definitely this shows that we are all not weak-minded and uh, we are all uh, you know, together to appreciate uh, this wealth of our world. I think this is the real wealth, the wealth of knowledge uh, and the wealth of thought because once you have the wealth of thought and wealth of knowledge, um, everything else is possible. So uh, really hearty congratulations and uh, look forward to a fantastic this week of uh, you know, deep thought, intellectual, um, uh, creative ideas uh, and uh, appreciation of, uh, of this incredible gift that we have as a humanity. All the best and thank you for inviting me. Very happy to be here and look forward to this week. Jai Guru. <clears throat> thank you very much, ma'am, for such brilliantly inspiring words. And also thank you for making time out of your busy schedule for attending the inaugural session. I'll be highly obliged if you kindly chair the session as well. But now it's time for the much awaited lecture. I request Professor Shayantan Dashgupta to kindly begin his lecture. Shayantan, it's over to you. Has he connected? Is he able to connect? Yes, thank you very much. I think there was a problem with the muting. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rajita Kulkarni, Professor Ajay Kumar Singh, Professor Ratikant Mahapatra, Professor Kalyani Samantrai, and Professor Rindon Kundu, and professors, faculty members of Sri Sri University. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this talk here. It is a rare privilege for, for me. And listening to all of you was quite instructive. And Professor Kulkarnik uh, brought back fond memories of this uh, symposium that we had with the University of East Anglia. And I shall in fact be touching upon the collaboration on academic social responsibility, which gave rise to this particular symposium that you were mentioning uh, sometime during my talk. Uh, it's actually a very difficult task doing this talk because I was initially preparing for primarily for the students of Sri Sri University. And now I think the list of attendees is quite impressive and intimidating. I see some very well-known scholars over here. So uh, let us see what we can make out of this. 
I uh, have a, a PowerPoint that I would like to share with you. So I'm just sharing my screen with you as I begin. Uh, is the PPT visible? Yes. Thank you. So the title of this talk is World Literature, Comparative Literature and Academic Social Responsibility. Now, as we all know, the last few decades have seen momentous changes as far as pedagogy in the humanities is concerned in India. The way we look at the humanities in India, what we expect from the humanities, the way we teach, approach, study the humanities, all of this has changed radically over the last few decades in the Indian context. We have seen, among other things, a radical reinvention of the humanities. The humanities is today understood in fresh and new ways, ways that are very different from the way we used to think of the humanities a couple of decades back. We have also seen radical reformulation of curricula in the humanities, in universities all over India. What was taught, what was expected to be part of the syllabus in the humanities departments in India, uh, this, this, this has gone through a major change. Various new areas, various news, new foci have worked their way into the curricula, replacing older schools of thought, older patterns. Along with that, we have seen a rediscovery of the utility of the humanities students in the job sector. Uh, there was a time not very long ago, well, some time back when I was joining as a student in the humanities, I remember hearing this refrain again and again, you're going to study the humanities, there are no jobs for students in the humanities. This has changed over the last few decades, this has changed radically. From my university, from my department, I cannot think of too many people over the last several batches who have not had jobs after studying the humanities. So uh, there is a market, society and market both are ready to use the skills, the sensitivities, the consciousness of the student of the humanities in India today. This marks a major change from the situation that we used to have earlier. Another important development, I feel, um, in changing the contour contours of humanities education in India is the new dynamics of private public universities that has come up in India. With the emergence of the private universities, we have seen a different kind of dynamics creeping into humanities education. There are positive things in everything. There are negative things in everything. One of the positive things of the private university structure has probably been that there is a modicum of flexibility that we have seen uh, as far as breaking down the earlier rigid compartmentalized structures between departments and disciplines are concerned. So because of the different priorities of private universities, we have seen more of interdisciplinary experimentation. We have seen um, employment of uh, uh, students, scholars from different departments into departments which have a different nomenclature. So I think this has been a, a very interesting development in terms of how it has impacted pedagogy in the humanities in India. I was also mentioning the emergence of interdisciplinarity and interdepartmentality in the humanities education in India. Gone are the times when we could think in terms of specific watertight departments and disciplines in our universities in the way humanities education was propagated in India. Now there is substantially more cooperation there is a substantial degree of collaboration among disciplines, among departments. There is cross-fertilization of ideas. We see not just 
departments in the humanities coming together, but we also see the sciences and the humanities working together hand in hand to bring to the student, to the field of research, their own areas of expertise. Digital humanities, for instance, environmental humanities, all of this speaks of new developments in the way pedagogy of the humanities is being envisaged in the Indian context. There are three terms that I have mentioned in the title of this talk, world literature, comparative literature, and academic social responsibility. I shall start with the third. I shall refer to the concept of world literature um, minimally because we have two speakers. The next two speakers will be talking in details specifically on the concept of world literature. Let me focus on academic social responsibility first. Academic social responsibility forms the focus of the Jadukpur University collaboration with the University of East Anglia. This is a current project that we are working on. It's a long-term collaboration whereby we are trying to explore different areas of implementing the idea of academic social responsibility in our respective university spaces. Now, what is academic social responsibility. As, uh, 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 as someone has already pointed out, the concept of academic social responsibility basically implies that we as academics, as teachers, we have a responsibility towards the larger society, a responsibility towards our communities, a responsibility towards our people, towards our nation. And this responsibility may manifest itself in several different ways. For instance, academic social responsibility may be seen to manifest itself in the shaping of curriculum itself. How curriculum is developed, devised, revised. This can be a pointer to implementing academic social responsibility. Another way in which academic social responsibility may manifest itself is in a perceived quest for relevance. Depending on the country, depending on the space where the university is located, how does one think of reshaping what is taught, how it is taught, the focus, the priorities of education? Uh, that could be part of our quest for relevance and that is definitely part of academic social responsibility. And the third route through which ASR may be manifested, I suggest, is that of outreach. In many ways, the idea of academic social responsibility is not really a very new concept. The name may not have been in currency very long ago, but the idea of making education relevant for the student for the realities of the stakeholders of that education is an old one. We remember, for instance, Gogi Wathyongo's idea of the quest for relevance in the 1960s. In its way, surely the idea of the quest for relevance is tied up with the notion of academic social, real, uh, social responsibility. Again, if we look at the history of cultural studies as a discipline, as an approach, the Center for Cultural Studies starts off at the University of Birmingham in the 1960s under the leadership of people like Richard Hoggart and Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall, in fact, writes an essay later on detailing the early history of the Center for Cultural Studies. And we get a bigger picture, more nuanced understanding of what the Center for Cultural Studies was trying to do in its heyday. It was talking about the need to take education beyond an ivory tower activity. So the Center for Cultural Studies was trying to pursue a pedagogy that would go beyond the university space and percolate directly into changing the lives of people outside the university. The lives of the working class people outside the university, these were being studied. The text, as well as the larger social context, 
these were to be studied within cultural studies as the Center for Cultural Studies was trying to posit its pedagogy. Again, the Center for Cultural Studies was suggesting that it is not only the canonical literature, but highbrow and popular, both of them would be part and parcel of the education of the curriculum. So what the Center for Cultural Studies was doing was in a way perhaps also related to our notion of academic social responsibility today because they were talking about taking education outside the space of the university into society at large, into community at large. Therefore, my suggestion is, my idea is that the idea of academic social responsibility is not entirely new. But perhaps there is a case for talking about this as a concept by itself and trying to see how we can embed our pedagogy in various Indian universities with the idea of academic social responsibility. I have also mentioned outreach as one of the avenues for uh, uh, implementing academic social responsibility. What do I mean by that? I am suggesting that at least one part of our education, one part of our curriculum may be dedicated to getting students to engage with life, with communities outside the university. With this in mind, we have undertaken um, a few small micro projects as it were within the Department of Comparative Literature at Jadupur University as we have been collaborating with the University of East Anglia on ASR. The primary access for our outreach program has been through translation. We have tried to uh, take translation as the, as the pivot using which we can have our students engage with communities outside the university. I'll give you some examples of some of the things that we are trying to do. Some time ago, we had some of our students engaging with students from Southfield College, Darjeeling. We had a group of students coming in to Jadupur from Southfield College a group of students who had Nepali as their first language. And the students at Jadupur mostly had Bangla as their first language. Uh, it, it was a treat to see these students interacting together, uh, 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 you know, spending time together for more than a month, which was the duration of this particular project. And during the course of this interaction, these students got together to translate each other's literature. So there were these Nepali speaking students from Southfield College who brought with them literary texts, short stories from the Nepali language, Indian Nepali language literature. And the students from Jadupur were engaging with the students from Southfield College and trying to understand these texts, trying to understand the value system, the cultural nuances that lay embedded within these texts, and finally to collaboratively translate these texts into English, into Bangla simultaneously. So this was one way in which we thought our students could actually get to know of the nuances, the cultures of other communities in India. Our country is so diverse. We have so many different uh, cultural repositories. And um, unle unless we are more conscious, more aware of these diversities, it is very difficult to have a proper understanding of India itself, forget about the world. Similarly, we have been experimenting with other literary genres. For instance, um, when we are talking about uh, Nepali literature, um, we learned that there was a dearth of uh, children's literature, contemporary children's literature uh, in the Nepali language in India. So one of the things that uh, we have been doing as part of our academic social responsibility program is to get students from the hills and students from the plains together and to turn children's literature from Bangla into Nepali. 
So it is the students that are getting together. Of course, they are guided by faculty members from both institutions. And the students are collaborating to translate these children's texts, children's short stories from Bangla into Nepali. And this, in fact, brought up a very interesting possibility. There were, there were these debates about whether or not children read these days. How popular is the habit of reading? And some people said that perhaps it's, it's, it's a, an age of pictures rather than an age of words. So the next step in our academic social responsibility outreach program was to take these texts into the realm of pictures. So using the resources that our student community has, you know, some of them are very good at drawing, some of them are good at painting, some of them are good at playing with words. So we made a selection of students from Sikkim University, from Southfield College, and from Jadavpur University. And one of the things they have been doing as part of this outreach collaboration program is they have been cooperating to turn short stories from Nepali and from Bangla into graphic narratives. So at the end of this program, we hope these graphic narratives, which are done entirely by our students of these three institutions, will be published. And this will hopefully uh, take the habit of reading further, give a boost to the habit of reading among children. What I'm suggesting is that through this kind of an outreach program, if we can embed such outreach programs, collaborative models within our pedagogy in the humanities, if we can include life projects like this within our curriculum, we can make, we can open up windows for our students to engage with life outside the university, to understand more of communities, languages, literatures, cultures outside their own all of which belong to India. There are so many Indias, uh, you know, and there's a little bit more of India that perhaps our students can be given exposure to by working in these live projects within our pedagogy in the humanities. I also suggest that all these developments, shaping of curriculum, reshaping of curriculum, quest for relevance, outreach models aimed to make education more relevant, all of this has always been implicit in the way the discipline of comparative literature has been practiced. It, is always, it has always been part and parcel of the discipline of comparative literature, which has sought to make itself more relevant to the needs of society, to the needs of students. This is because comparative literature, as many scholars have said, always suffers from an anxiety. Comparative literature has, has, been, seen, has been called an anxiogenic discipline because it has to define itself against other disciplines that are generally more visible, such as uh, uh, you know, let us say single literature uh, disciplines and departments as, as they are called. That brings us to the next question of what is comparative literature? The label has two parts. It's of course the study of literature, but it's the study of literature within a comparative framework which means that we are generally talking about comparative readings between literatures of two or more languages or nations. So not the singular, but the plural, not the one, but the many, many literatures taken together. This could be two literatures, this could be more than two literatures. It could be, theoretically speaking, a study of the literatures of the world. In, in, in other words, we can study within the same classroom literary works from different languages written from different parts of the world. The study of a world literature, perhaps, that is one of the ways in which comparative literature can be understood, where there are no borders or boundaries of language or nation, where we are open to hearing, to listening to uh, uh, the riches of world literature. When I'm mentioning world literature here, I am 
merely referring to, in a very general sense, literary works taken from all over the world. So Spanish literature, French literature, Hindi literature, Korean literature, and so on and so forth, studying all of them together. That is what I mean here, because this is important to clarify, because the label world literature has some specific meanings, specific debates and arguments historically attached to it. There are these very important questions that have come up from critics about world literature. Some of the questions that world literature deals with is how does literature travel across border, uh, the role of translations, how do genres move over boundaries, over borders, across literatures, and so on and so forth. So I, I am not going into those areas. When I refer to world literature here, I'm merely talking about literatures of the world. So theoretically speaking, comparative literature is a discipline that allows us the freedom of studying together literary works written in different languages from all corners of the world. It is possible to read all of this together in one endeavor. That is the promise of comparative literature. Um, I have just put up over here some of the basic questions that often come up for a student, a scholar of comparative literature. These are the basic questions, I suppose, that often one has to face. Susan Bassnett, who wrote a very influential book on comparative literature several decades ago, defines comparative literature in these ways. It is the study of literatures in relation to each other. In other words, the study of literatures of the world. It is also a study of literature in relation to the other arts. So the boundaries of comparative literature are very, very fluid. We are not restricted to the study of books, printed books. All kinds of art forms can be part and parcel of comparative literature. And um, I will remind you at this point that while this has been the case in our understanding of comparative literature for several decades, what we have seen um, as far as recent developments in the humanities is concerned is precisely this. We have been seeing humanities departments gradually moving away from a sole and exclusive focus on the printed text to incorporating within the curriculum texts from other art forms. So this is something that comparative literature may have pioneered, but it is something that is catching on. It is something that is probably going to be part and parcel of our pedagogy in the humanities for some time now in the future. Connection is really the key word for the discipline of comparative literature. Because as we talk about plurality, as we talk about multiple texts from multiple languages, from multiple countries being studied together, what is imperative is that the scholar establishes these patterns of connection. Because it is not enough to say, we can look at the entire world. We can look at the entire world, but to make sense of it, we must develop a method of reading, a method of reading that will allow us to make sense of the networks of the interactions between literary works from all over the world. There is a school of thought that comparative literature is far from being an esoteric discipline, far from being a high falutine concept, comparative literature is merely a name for the most commonsensical approach to studying literature. Is it not only natural for the student of literature to go back to the Latin sources while reading Shakespeare, for instance? That is comparative literature. But isn't that the most commonsensical thing for the student of literature to do? Can we read Shakespeare by himself? Or do we need to look at the sources, the influences, the receptions that go hand in hand with Shakespeare? It's a very interesting example that Susan Bassnett gives, that of Geoffrey Chaucer. We are all aware of Chaucer's contribution, 1300 to, uh, 1340 to 1400. He's well known for the Canterbury Tales. Uh, 
And if we were to sum up the Canterbury Tales in three or four bullet points, which is written in Middle English, it is a framed narrative where we encounter a group of pilgrims who, as they travel on their pilgrimage, they indulge in a storytelling contest. So there is a narrative within a larger narrative. That's the framed narrative. This is how the narrative of the Canterbury Tales is evolved. Now we have read the Canterbury Tales and we come across a text called Il Decameron, the Decameron, which is written by the Italian writer Giovanni Boccaccio, 1313 to 1375. Let us see what the Decameron is about. Written in Italian, it is a frame narrative. We see that the plague has come to Florence and a group of 10 young men and women are trying to flee Florence in order to escape the plague. And they have time on their hands in order to ward off boredom on the journey, they decide to tell stories to each other. A 10 day journey, 10 men and women, that gives you 100 stories. We have a few less than 100, but it's, it's basically a framed tale again. It's the characters of the story who are traveling, who decide to tell stories and all these stories make up the larger story. Immediately, the reader will be reminded of Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. The structure is so similar. This narrative strategy is so similar. Herein comes in comparison. Herein comes in comparative literature. This is the most natural thing for any human reader to do. Our species makes sense of literature by comparing. That is why perhaps several scholars would say that comparative literature is actually the instinctive most spontaneous, most commonsensical way of looking at literature, where we dismantle all boundaries and borders of language, where we keep ourselves open to looking at literary works from across the world together uh, in, in, in the light of their network. Similarly, if we come to the Indian context, the Dhala Madan Shundari story in the Katha Sarit Sagar, and we come across the novella called The Transposed Heads in German, written by Thomas Mann, 1940, which is actually inspired by the story in the Kathasarit Sagar, where one person's head gets switched onto another person's body and vice versa. And then we come down to the 1970s, where Girish Karnad writes this play called Hayavadan. It's the same narrative is the same story being deployed for different purposes by different writers across time, across space, across languages. This is such an exciting endeavor to try and connect the dots, to try and understand this journey of the Kathasarit Sagar story to Germany and then back to Karnataka, India. This is the excitement that comparative literature offers. It's a study of, among other things, these networks, these interactions that produce the riches, the wealth of world literature. Going by the orthodox definition, the difference between single literature and comparative literature has traditionally been mentioned in this way. A single literature would study one language literature. So the study of English literature would traditionally look at only literary works written in English. The study of Bangla Shahitto would look at only Bangla literary works along a vertical axis. On the other hand, comparative literature claims that no literature evolves in isolation. We are all tied up within a much larger network. No human being is alone on this planet. No literature flourishes alone on this planet. And therefore, we need to take cognizance of these networks of influences, relations and receptions that generate world literature. However, my contention is that this distinction may not really hold tight any longer 
to a very great extent, precisely because of the way humanity's education has changed over the last few decades. If we look at the way curricula have changed in different universities in the Indian context over the last few decades, we will see that uh, this, this watertight definition between what we used to call single literature and what used to be called comparative literature probably it does not exist in this way. Because today, the syllabi of most literature departments in India, most progressive literature departments in India have changed radically. There are languages, there are traditions, there are texts from other spaces that have been brought into the purview of the classroom. For many students, this is an important question that comes up because comparative literature promises to offer the opportunity of reading the world. And as we know, the literatures are written in many different languages, thousands of different languages all across the world. So if we do not know these languages, how are we to read these literatures? How many languages do we have to know? This is a question that students often come up with. I think we can safely assume that in most places, comparative literature would deploy a certain amount of reading in translation since we, most of us, have access to two or three or maybe four languages. Some of the course material would be read in translation and some of it would be read in the original. Although at the doctoral level, most institutions probably today desire that the research is carried out based on readings of the texts in the original language. Where is comparative literature taught? Comparative literature is taught as a subject at several, at a number of universities all across the world. And indeed, comparative literature today is taught in various forms uh, in a number of universities across India. However, it is important to note that it is not just the named departments of comparative literature that we need to look at when we are looking at comparative literature in India because there are many unnamed comparative literature spaces in India. Many departments of single literature, the, the nomenclature may be single literature, it may be English, it may be Bangla, it may be Hindi, but the syllabus, the curriculum has expanded so much so that they resemble uh, comparative literature for all intents and purposes. So these are historic times that we are living in. And this, this opening up, this proliferation offers us vast opportunities for understanding the resources of world literature, for understanding the diversities of world literature. And I'm sure this promise bodes well for the future. One of the criticisms that often comes up for comparative literature is there is just too much. If we are talking about reading the literatures of the world and we imagine so many different languages that we use for creating literature, how is it possible to read world literature? That is where the question of method comes in. And comparative literature often throws up these three as points of entry into the variety of literary texts from all over the world, thematology, genealogy, and historiography. These are by no means exhaustive. There is nothing sacred about these, these three tools, but they can offer us a certain um, uh, uh, advantage in trying to make sense of the huge variety of texts that we will encounter. So we can use theme, for instance, to tie up literary texts from different parts of the world, from different languages, we can use genre as another point of entry to tie up and make sense of texts from across the world. We can use history writing as another axis for comparing world literatures. I will just skip over a few slides.
Shishir Kumar Dash has given a very exhaustive narrative of the history of comparative literature in terms of landmarks. Any history of comparative literature invariably goes back to 1827 when the German poet, novelist, critique, essayist, Goethe uses the term Welt Literatur in the German. The term Welt Literatur would literally translate into English as world literature, and therefore it has some significance for uh, those championing comparative literature, for those championing the cause of world literature. Goethe talks about his contention that the age of national literature is now gone. It is now time for Welt literature. So in the German context, in the European context, the idea of Welt literature or Welt literature was coming up, was emerging as almost an antidote to national literature. We will note that in the Indian context, this was not so. National literature and well literature were not opposed to each other in the way we have understood it in India. But in Europe, that was the case. Soon thereafter, we see the idea of comparative literature being enunciated in other languages in Europe as well. And in the Indian context, one of the major landmarks is 1907, when Rabindranath Tagore delivers this lecture at the National Council of Education on Bisho Shahitto. Bisho Shahitto, again, translated into English, it would translate into world literature. But perhaps what Goethe suggested by wealth literature was different from what Rabindranath was suggesting with, with, with the name uh, uh, Bisho Shahitto. Rabindranath was talking about expanding the boundaries of literary studies, expanding the boundaries of what we understood as literature itself. So from this little quote that you see as part of this slideshow, you will realize that Rabindranath was talking about breaking free of the shackles of narrow provincialism. And this provincialism could manifest itself in terms of restricting our studies to one language, one country, one space. He was suggesting of a larger space. He was suggesting a larger space into which literary studies must uh, uh, approach, into which literary studies must enter, where these uh, uh, boundaries, these borders need not be taken very seriously. And in fact, Rabindranath was also suggesting uh, that there is something called man's universal creativity, which means not just literature in the sense of printed text, but literature in a larger sense, in the, in the sense of human creativity itself, which could manifest itself in multiple genres, in multiple media. All of that could be part and parcel of our attention. The institutional history of comparative literature starts in 1956, as Shishir Kumar Dash has pointed out in his essay, uh, which is when the first Department of Comparative Literature is officially founded at Jadukpur University. Thereafter, in 1974, we see a very significant move in this history, where the University of Delhi starts a course not in comparative literature, but in comparative Indian literature. So that, that's a new nomenclature that comes up slightly different from what Jadupur was practicing since 1956. Jadupur was doing comparative literature. Delhi University now starts doing comparative Indian literature. The focus of Jadupur was on reading literatures from different parts of the world, yes, as far as was feasible. Whereas the Department of Modern Indian Languages, University of Delhi, um, championed the cause of a comparative study between and among Indian languages and Indian literatures. So there was a slight difference, but we must notice that both employ a similar impetus. Both are uh, 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 embodying the impetus of breaking out of a given space, of extending the 
barriers extending the horizons of literary studies beyond the single language. Over time, the study of Indian literature has become more and more important within comparative literature as it has been done in India. In the initial phase of comparative literature in India, there were three core areas of focus. Buddhudev Bushu, who helped found the first department of comparative literature in India, wrote in an essay that was published in the 1959 edition of YCGL, Yearbook of Comparative and General Literature, one of the most respected journals of comparative literature in those days. He wrote an article called Comparative Literature in India. And in that essay, Bose highlights how comparative literature was being practiced in India at that time. So that is a very important historical document. It helps us understand how comparative literature struck roots in India, how we started thinking about moving out of language oriented studies and moving into a space of literary studies where we could look at literatures written in different languages together. Buddhudev Boshu writes that in the initial period, there were three areas of focus. The first focus was on Bangla literature because it was felt that Jadavpur University was in Bengal. And this was, as, as, as I quote from him, the living literature of the land. So the resources were easily available when it came to Bangla literature. So that constituted the first core area of comparative literature. The second core area of comparative literature in its initial period, the first two, three decades perhaps, was Sanskrit literature, Sanskrit. Because Sanskrit was seen to be the root of the modern languages. When, when, when the focus was on Bangla literature, the focus also had to be on Sanskrit literature. This was the perception. So the second core area within comparative literature on which there would be an extensive focus was Sanskrit literature. And the third core area, Bose explains in his essay, was not English literature, but Western literature. So there was, there was an anti-colonial thrust as well in, in the way this was um, organized. It was not just literature of England, but literature of the Western world, of Europe by and large. Later on, we see in the 1970s, uh, the Department of Comparative Literature also moves towards incorporating the study of modern Indian literatures in a much more substantial way with a syllabus revamp that becomes effective in 1978. And since then, I think in most parts of India, comparative literature has tended to look at world literature, yes, but world literature with a thrust on Indian literature. So it's all about, uh, it's, it's been all about opening our windows so that the winds come in, but it's also about placing our feet very firmly on the ground so that these winds do not blow us away. It's about creating some kind of a symphony, some kind of a harmony between the home and the world. It's about understanding the world, but it's about understanding the world on our terms. So India would remain at the center of this pedagogy in many, many different ways for a long time since the 1970s, even today within comparative literature, pedagogy in India, uh, Indian literature remains uh, an important area. And we see perhaps here that in the way the initial comparative literature identifies its thrust areas, there is a clear quest for relevance long before the term is used by Nkugi Wathyong. Because what we are trying to do in India at that time is we are trying to understand how we can reformulate a discipline that is already there in the Western world on our terms. We are trying to create a comparative literature that would be more relevant to our realities in India. This has been the defining characteristic of comparative literature. Perhaps comparative literature is best seen as a conjunctural practice. As the discipline moves from one space to another, from one university to another, from one metropolis to the suburb, and so on and so forth, 
the dimensions, the avatar of comparative literature must change because that is the only way it will remain relevant to its immediate stakeholders. This is one of the most important things about comparative literature, perhaps. We see in the 1980s, uh, this thrust on Indian literature becoming very, very clear. The important books on comparative literature that are published in the 1980s all have to do in some way or the other with the Indian context. Amyo Dev's The Idea of Comparative Literature in India, Shapun Majumdar, Comparative Literature, Indian Dimensions, Nobunita Devshen's Counterpoints, all of these books which are published in the 1980s, which are very important for comparative literature, all of them focus on the Indian context. Again, Chandra Mohan's book, Anthology of Essays, which is uh, one of the earliest such uh, and very important um, endeavors in the Indian context has a lot of scope for the Indian context to be showcased over their aspects of comparative literature. There are other areas that have gradually become more and more popular within comparative literature, but what has persisted is perhaps our focus on the Indian realities. And these are uh, uh, probably areas that need to remain at the center because we are doing comparative literature in India. And so the Indian realities uh, probably need to be taken into account. I would just like to point out one thing that strikes me very curious in this history of the development of comparative literature. the evolution of comparative literature. In the United States of America, the ACLA, the American Comparative Literature Association, which is the platform for comparatists in the USA, it has this provision of periodic reviews of the discipline. So after a period of 10 years, 15 years, you have commissions being instituted by the ACLA and the task of the commission is generally to take stock of comparative literature at that point of time. Where is the discipline heading? What are the directions it needs to inculcate and take? The first three tabled reports, the Levin report, the Green report, and the Bernheimer report do precisely that in their respective times. They talk about the threats to comparative literature, the promises of comparative literature, and they offer recommendations on standards to be maintained in comparative literature. One of the areas of contention is the study of literature in translation. And the Levin report of 1965 is quite reticent about reading in translation. The idea is that literature cannot be read in translation in the classroom. It's not a serious activity. More or less a similar idea is propagated in the Green Report of 1975. There is a reluctance to accommodate reading in translation in the university curriculum. However, by the time the Bernheimer Report is published in 1993, we see a marked change. And the Bernheimer report actually seems to legitimize in its own way a greater, a more substantial study of literature in translation in the university classroom. The idea is that comparative literature needs to go out of its boundaries because if we are only reading literature in the original language, then we are limited. So comparative literature as a discipline, it is felt at this time, needs to incorporate some amount of literature which is read in translation. What strikes me very as very curious is the fact that this debate plays out in a very different way in the Indian context. I'm going back again to the 1959 essay by Bhutodev Boshu, which I mentioned to you before, Comparative Literature in India, published in YCGL. This is precisely the question that Buddha de Boshu deals with, among many other questions. Can literature be studied in translation? And Buddha de Boshu's answer to this question is a resounding yes. 
he offers these two options. The first option is to restrict ourselves to the studying literatures from those languages which we can study in the original, which would mean our idea of the riches of world literature would remain very limited. And the second option would be to read literature in translation as part of the curriculum of comparative literature, be aware of the fact that it is literature in translation, be aware of the fact that there may be some losses in this translation, but at the same time, this is something that would open up the vista of world literature that would expose the reader, the student, the teacher to the wealth of human literary, literary creativity across borders, across space, across time. And Buddha Bushu suggests it is the former that the philologist would like to go by, but for the student of the humanities, for the student of literature who enjoys reading, which is why he or she has taken up literature, for him or her, it is the second option that is by far preferable to read in, in translation and to therefore open up in front of our eyes the wealth of human creativity, the wealth of world literature. So this is just one instance where uh, the resolution of this question in the United States of America was preceded by a resolution of the same question in India by many decades. This was perhaps natural in a way because of the context of Indian society. Our multilingualism, our multiculturalism perhaps compels us to engage with ideas of translation in ways that are more organic to us. That is perhaps why early comparatists uh, had to resolve this question of reading and translation very early on in the history of comparative literature in India. Today, with the world becoming smaller, it has become even easier to deal with the world, to engage with the world, and to engage with comparative literature as it is being practiced in different parts of the world. There is an international association of comparative literature, and the major developments, the major thrusts in our discipline can be seen by looking at their website. Similarly, there are national bodies of comparative literature, and these national bodies have their websites where they post all the developments in, in this discipline in their respective countries. These are all resources that are very useful to the student of comparative literature, to the scholar of comparative literature who wishes to trace and follow the directions, the trajectories that our discipline is taking across the world. Uh, finally, of course, this is the Indian uh, National Association. Clive. These are the websites in case any of the students here wishes to uh, follow this up and take a look at this. I think I have finished uh, absolutely uh, on the one hour limit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shantan Dashupta, for such a brilliant and informative talk. We'll now take questions. Uh, a participant, uh, his name, her name is Madhuri Rana, and she has posted that, sir, can you elaborate the meaning of the term transculturation and its relationship with comparative literature? It's a very difficult question. I'm very scared of such difficult words. <laughs> I think uh, the idea of comparative literature is predicated upon the idea of plurality. And when we talk about comparative literature today, we are no longer talking in terms of uh, just literary texts. We are talking about cultures of the world because all literatures are embedded within a cultural system, a set of values that inform these literary texts. So comparative literature today is really uh, can be seen as bridge building, as an exercise in bridge building. Uh, 
It's an exercise in trying to bridge different cultural spaces. It's an attempt to get to grips with, to understand the values that are embedded within multiple cultural systems. In that way, perhaps we make sense of the world as we make sense of ourselves. That is perhaps what comparative literature seeks to do. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, that's the way I would respond to that question. Thank you, Shantanda. Another participant, Ajay, posted that, how can we see world literature theory helping the formation of Indian world literature theories, studying world literature from native language perspective? Yes, uh, this is, I think, directly related to Mrinmoy's topic, because Mrinmoy is going to speak exactly on this topic as far as I understand. But in very brief, the idea of world literature has been reinvented in recent times. I mentioned Goethe, who was, of course, several centuries ago. But in recent decades, the idea of world literature has become more popular. It has gained greater currency again. And side by side with the idea of, of world literature being more becoming more popular, we have also seen the emergence of criticisms of the idea of world literature. Because one of the criticisms that have come up is that world literature is often done in English. And the moment world literature is done in English exclusively, what that means is that we are banking on a study of world literature using only texts that are or can be easily translated into English. There are texts from the bhashas which are easily translated into English. There are texts from the bhashas that are not easily translated into English. There are some texts that are extremely culture specific, which may be very difficult to translate into English. So what would happen is these culture specific texts, Dalit literature, for instance, just to give one example, this could remain outside the purview of world literature which means that it is actually very important to interrogate the model of world literature that is being used. And we must ensure that the different spaces that have been marginalized, these marginalized spaces are represented substantially within the idea of world literature. That is the challenge of taking up world literature. Uh, we must ensure that in our enthusiasm to embrace the world, we do not forget the whole indigeneity, the Indian realities, all of this must be embedded within our idea of world literature. We have to create our own model of world literature. That is what I meant by conjun conjunctural practice about comparative literature. And the last question that I can take because of the time shortage, what is your opinion regarding loss of essence while translation? Ah, that's an excellent question and very relevant because uh, ever since universities started teaching literature in translation, this is a question that uh, academics have been facing. And, the, and time and again, this comes up. You are reading Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, but are you really reading Garcia Marquez's Cien Años do Soledad? The answer is no, we are not. But if we do not have access to the original language, one option could be not to read this text at all. The other option would be to read this text in whatever version comes to me. So it is the lesser of the two evils, perhaps. And uh, it is the only way of understanding the other and therefore of understanding the self. We do talk about losses in translation. Yes, translation is a very, very challenging and a most difficult task, something that very often we do not realize. Uh, you know, the great translators of the world, Anthea Bell, Derek Hockridge, Closer Home, uh, Kurutulin Haider, Jatindra Kumar Nayak, you know, the, the, the great translators, the, the most effective translators, they have gone through a very difficult process in trying to render a text from one language into another. And yes, there are slips, there are things that do not come through in the translation because two languages are different. The idiom of one language will not find an equivalent, an exact equivalence in another language. There will be certain losses, but I think it is not enough to talk about losses in translation. It is time, particularly for a country like India to talk about gains in translation. We might lose certain nuances in translation, but what do we have to gain? Through translation, we have to gain 
India itself. For it is perhaps only in translation that India exists. It is only through translation that we can understand India. The world will come soon after. Thank you, Shantanda. Thank you. However, I'm overwhelmed by the large now interest all of you have shown towards this talk today. I hope to see you all and more participants in the next talk, which is scheduled on 5th August at 4.45 p.m. We'll increase the cap from 500 to 1,000 participants next day. As for the feedback form, we're very sorry that due to technical glitch, it did not work. However, we request the participants not to worry because we'll provide you the feedback form from the next day onwards. Lastly, I once uh, again thank our esteemed speaker, Professor Dash Gupta, for accepting our invitation and joining us today and enriching us with his very informative talk. Last but not the least, I am extremely grateful to my esteemed colleagues for showing me all the support that they have always shown towards me. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Madam. Thank you, VC Sir. Thank you, Guru Ratikanti. And thank you, our HOD Kalani Ma'am. This was a very good start and we hope to have a very fruitful webinar with your support and see you all the next day. Thank you. I thank all the participants. Very hearty thanks from my side to all the participants. Everyone in fact were present. And thank you, Professor Dasgupta for this such a revealing and brilliant talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. With your kind permission, can I uh, end this meeting? Yes, of course, we have to end on time. And everyone has been so careful about time, including the chief, including the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Rindan. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. See you in, on 5th, 4.45 p.m.